bombshells. And you might ask yourself, what, what are we going to talk about? And we're going to talk about the postoperative complications in the bariatric surgery patients. Now, a few years ago, I noticed I started to see more and more patients in my daily practice that when you took a history, it said had some sort of bariatric procedure being performed. They often said, I've had a lap band, I've had a band, I've had a sleeve, sleeve gastrectomy, ruin Y, I've had bariatric surgery. And there's a lot of terms there. And I think as emergency doctors, we're not necessarily familiar with how these procedures differ. And more importantly, we're not aware of the really disastrous complications that these patients can have when things go wrong. So that was really one of the motivating factors for why I decided to do this talk. So I hope by the end of the talk today, you're all better able to navigate your way through the minefield of complications that can occur in this group of patients. Now, let's begin with a case. This is a real case that came to our department. It was a 23-year-old female that had a one-day history of diffuse abdominal pain and vomiting. So you get a background story on her, and she's had a ruin y gastric bypass done six months ago. A set of vitals are done, essentially unremarkable. You get bloods, including CRP, that's normal. And you even get some imaging. Plain film doesn't show any evidence of bowel obstruction. You go on to get a CT, and that too is normal. So I want you to think for a second, what are you going to do with this patient? You have a young female coming in with abdominal pain and vomiting, not all that uncommon. Are you going to discharge her home with return advice with some antiemetics? Or are you going to call the surgical reg to come down and review a patient in your department that has had a normal CT? I want you to think about what you're going to do with this case, and we'll get back to it at the end of the talk. So let's talk about obesity and bariatric surgery. Now, in Australia, over 28% of the population is obese. This isn't just overweight and obese. This is obese. BMI is greater than 30. So think about it. One in three ED patients you see adult-wise are obese. However, of this, only less than 1% of the people eligible for bariatric surgery go on to get surgical procedures. So this is this is around 15,000 cases a year. So divide that between five states, and yes, they are coming through the pipeline here. Now, why are people getting these procedures? Well, bariatric su surgery is the only proven treatment for sustained weight loss. Uh, diet and exercise actually has a poor long-term track record in patients keeping that weight off at five years, versus surgery where up to 75 to 85% of that initial weight loss is still off five years down the road. The other thing is, how safe are these procedures? Well, it might shock you to realize that bariatric surgery, such as a ruin y gastric bypass, has a 30-day mortality of 0.08%. And to put things into context, that's on par with a lap coli. So they're actually pretty safe. And a lot of that has done, been due to a move from open to laparoscopic techniques. And I'm sure you're all asking yourself now, why do I need to care about bariatric surgery? kind of niche group of patients, and aren't these procedures just performed at large tertiary centers or private hospitals? I work in a regional hospital, or I work in a, an urban district hospital. Why do I need to know about this? And you're right, they are performed at larger centers. However, when these patients experience complications, guess what? They go to their closest ED. And that's why all of us need to be familiar with these procedures and the things that can go wrong. And the other thing is, the biggest reason these patients have bad outcomes is just due to a failure to consider the problem. And I hope by the end of the talk today, you're more aware of the things that can go wrong. And the next patient you see that has had one of these procedures, you always ask yourself in the back of your head, did I consider this? And have I excluded it before I send them out the door? Now, let's review bariatric procedures here. Now, there's two major techniques. One is a restrictive technique, which attempts to decrease the size of the stomach and limit the amount of food that patient can ingest. The other one is a malabsorptive procedure, where they actually bypass limbs of small bowel in order to decrease nutrient absorption. And some bariatric procedures actually incorporate both techniques. Now, in Australasia, there's what I'd like to call the big three three procedures that account for over 75% of all the bariatric procedures being performed out there. 
And the first one is the laparoscopic adjustable gastric band. You might have heard of the trade name of the device, the lap band. That's it. Next one is the sleeve gastrectomy. And finally, the Roux and Y gastric bypass, which is by far the most common uh, form of bariatric surgery being performed. So if you're familiar with these, you're covering yourself for a majority of the procedures you will encounter. So let's talk about the gastric band. This has been around for a while, and I'm sure we've all seen a few patients that have had these. And this is purely restrictive technique. And what the surgeon does is he goes in laparoscopically and places an adjustable elastic band right below the gastroesophageal junction. And what this does is it creates a small gastric pouch, usually around the volume of 30 to 50 mils, which is about the volume of a shot glass. And that limits the amount of food that patient can ingest. Now, this became popular because this is a very minimally invasive technique. It often can be done as a day procedure where the patients go in and have it placed. However, despite this apparent simplicity, it's actually falling out of favor with most bariatric surgeons and patients. And the reason being, these patients experience a significant number of side effects from the procedure. About 75 to 80 percent of them develop long-term dyspepsia or gastritis. And the other thing is they've often found ways to gain weight despite this procedure. They'll frequently liquefy Snickers bars, eat high caloric diets, and they often have the band deflated at times, such as around the Christmas holidays. So it wasn't that effective, and this is, we're moving on from that. Complications with the gastric band to be familiar with, most of these occur late, after that first month post-operative. And the two you need to be familiar with are slippage and mechanical problems. Now, slippage is probably the most significant complication because when patients experience slippage, that band falls out of its normal position, kinks the stomach, and left untreated, that can progress to gastric erosion, ischemia, necrosis, and even perforation. So this is a very dramatic you know, presentation, and it also is the most high-risk complication these patients can experience. These patients often come in with sudden onset of epigastric pain, nausea, vomiting, and food and liquid intolerance. The other complication to be familiar with in this procedure is that mechanical problems. This is a medical advice, and they can experience complications with that. You can get port site infections. You can get fractures, or kinking of the tubing, or disconnections of the, the connecting tubing. Now, when you have a patient that's had a gastric band come into the, your emergency department, your initial investigations should be a abdominal plane film. And when you get it, there's going to be a couple things you're going to be looking at here. The first one is called the phi angle. And the phi angle, as you can see from this diagram, is a line drawn through the vertical axis of the spinal column and a line drawn through the body of that uh, band. Now, where those two lines come together, that is what's called your phi angle, and the phi angle should be between 4 and 58 degrees. Now, if you measure anything outside of that, it indicates some degree of slippage has occurred. The other thing you might see is, is what is called the O sign. So normally, a gastric band, if it's in the correct position, appears like a hockey puck on its side. Now, if slippage has occurred, sometimes there's a rotational component of that slippage and that band will appear as a ring-like structure on your uh, plane films, such as this uh, picture here illustrates. Now, if you have a patient that does come in with abdominal complaints and you're concerned there could be a slippage or an erosion and your plane films are equivocal, the next step would be to progress to CT. And that has the advantage of showing if there's any other mechanical problems going on with the band. Now, gastric sleeve. Just a show of hands, how many people have seen patients with gastric sleeves? All right, the majority of you have. This is replacing the gastric band in terms of frequency. Now, this, like the band, is purely restrictive procedure. And what the surgeon does here, he goes in and does a staple resection along the greater curvature of the stomach, essentially removing 70% of the stomach. And what's left is a, a narrow gastric tube, which, like that band, limits the food intake. Now, it's an intermediate procedure. Unlike gastric bypass surgery, it doesn't involve any anastomoses of the bowel. And it has good long-term reduction in BMI. So this is really replacing the lap band. Now, complications with gastric sleeves can be divided into two groups, early and late complications. And by far the most devastating complication here, which you need to be familiar with, is leak. 
And this is a very early complication within the first 30 days. And one study looked at this, about 80% of the complications or the leaks occur in the first 10 days. So if you have any patient coming into your department that has had any sort of abdominal complaint post gastric sleeve surgery, always consider this. Now, this is a tricky diagnosis to make because these patients rarely come in with abdominal pain or frank peritoneism. They can often come in with subtle you know, fevers, tachycardia, tachypnea. What else can that mimic? That can mimic a lot of things. That could uh, mimic sepsis, it could mimic PE, UTIs. It's just something you need to consider because they're not going to come in to you with the words leak written on them. So it should always be in your differential when you get these early post-op patients. Now, stricture is a complication that is a later presentation, usually after six months, and that is more of an, uh, a gradual onset of food intolerance, nausea, and vomiting with eating. Now, the biggest thing to make the diagnosis is just to consider in the first place. Any post-op patient, consider the possibility of a leak. The other thing you should do early on is get the bariatric surgeon who performed the procedure on board early. Now, fortunately, most of these patients have had some sort of follow-up arranged with the, the surgeon. They will usually have a card of the surgeon who's performed the procedure, or they'll have a packet with it. And the good thing is most of these surgeons that do this want to have follow-up on their patients. Now, in general, your investigation should begin with a CT. Now, the difference with a CT when you're doing it for querying a leak in a gastric sleeve is that you're going to use oral contrast. You're going to use the IV contrast, but in addition to this, on the table, that patient will fr frequently do a on-the-table shot of oral contrast to kind of outline that gastric pouch while, before they're doing the CT. And CT, it's a good test, but it does have limits. For detecting a gastric leak, the sensitivity is only around 78 to 82 percent. So it's important to know that even though the CT might be normal, there can still be a reasonable chance that patient might have a leak. And this is why most surgeons that do this will take that patient back to theater to either do an endoscopy or a laparoscopy to check the integrity of that staple line. And finally, we'll get to a gastric bypass. And that's probably the most invasive of all the bariatric procedures you will encounter. And with it, it uses both a restrictive and malabsorptive technique. And the most common one being performed today is the Roux Y gastric bypass. Now, to understand the things that can go wrong here, it's important to understand the basic anatomy of this procedure. Now, like the gastric sleeve, what the surgeon does is they do a staple resection of the greater curvature of the stomach and creates a small gastric pouch, as you can see up there. What's left is a gastric remnant. What they do is they follow the bowel down and around the mid jejunum they do a staple resection there, bring up the distal component and anastomose it to the bowel and the proximal segment goes down further. It's a fairly complicated thing, but what you get at the end is three distinct limbs of bowel. And it's important to understand this because based upon if a patient has an obstruction there, you're going to get vastly different complications and symptoms with that. If it occurs in that common channel where the two limbs come together, you're going to get abdominal distension, pain, and vomiting. However, if it occurs in that Roux and Y component on the, or excuse me, the biliopancreatic limb here, you're just going to get gastric distension, abdominal pain. You will not get any vomiting, despite there being an obstruction. Again, divide the complications in gastric bypass surgery into two groups, early and late. Leak, like the sleeve, is the big one you want to consider early on. Again, probably within the first 30 days. It can occur at that staple line or where they anastomose the limbs of bowel together. And again, with leak, a very insidious presentation. Fever and tachycardia are the earliest signs of this. The other complication, which can occur months down the road, say six months and more, is what's called internal hernias. And often when the surgeon does the uh, bowel anastomoses, they will create mesenteric defects in the mesentery that as that patient loses weight, those initially small mesenteric defects become larger and larger and forming holes that small bowel can get trapped into and incarcerated and potentially strangulated. Now, the important thing to remember here is if you have a gastric bypass patient that comes in with any sort of bowel obstruction, that should be considered an internal hernia until proven otherwise. And the big difference with this is you don't want to manage an incarcerated hernia conservatively like you would with secondary adhesions. 
because there is a risk of developing bowel ischemia and bowel necrosis with it. Surgeons often want to take this back to theater early on to reduce it. So again, big thing is just consider the complication in the beginning. Post-op patients early on leak, later on uh, internal hernia. Get the bariatric surgeon on board early. CT, again, for patients that have had uh, bypass surgery, you're going to use oral contrast. It helps the radiologist define the anatomy better, but it will also help to detect the leak in the various limbs of bowel. And again, despite having a normal CT, don't necessarily stop there. Most surgeons will take this back to theater for an open re-exploration or laparoscopy. So getting back to our case, that 23-year-old female with abdominal pain and vomiting, you get a surgical consult on them. They take her to theater, do a laparoscopy, and it's revealed she's got an internal hernia with strangulated small bowel loops. So take home points of the talk. Bariatric surgery, it's here to stay. It is an ED problem. You should be familiar with the basic procedures and more importantly, the complications that can arise from those procedures. The biggest reason for a bad outcome in these patients is just due to a failure to consider the complications. So hopefully after today's talk, you're more familiar with this and the next patient you see, you'll make sure you ask yourself that question. And again, get the bariatric surgeons on board early. We have access to hopefully their contact details with the patient and most of them are happy to be contacted with and then we'll take ownership of the patient. All right, thank you.